Hey, I got a question for you. Do you love leftovers? Now, there's, there's two type of people. There's people like me that I almost get more excited about leftovers than I do the actual meal when it's like prepared right there before I receive it. Like something about leftovers. I go to a Mexican restaurant. I'm going to go crazy on chips and salsa so I know I get like half of my meal for tomorrow. And then there's a group of people, and I know a few of you, and you, you weird me out where you can't eat leftovers. You're not okay with it. You feel like something's wrong about it. But the, these two type of people, then there's, there's like third, like my wife, she loves leftovers, but she almost loves leftovers for a whole different reason. Like I want leftovers because it's just like a whole nother meal that I get to have, that I get to, I don't have to think about it for the next day. My wife loves leftovers more because of a simple thing, the container. The container she's ecstatic about. Why? Because she didn't have to buy it, but now she can reuse it. Like all the time, she, we got things in here. You can get excited. You open our fridge. You see leftovers. You open it, and instead there's beans and rice in there. You're like, what? That's not what I expected. We go to extremes. You might be like us, where every container we reuse. So you open our fridge, and you're like, dude, I need some sour cream. You open it. It's not sour cream in there. Like, it's not the same thing you thought it would be because we're going to reuse the vessel, right? And, and here's the thing about leftovers. Leftovers don't actually have, they have less nutrients, they're, they're, they're less quality, but for some reason we like leftovers. But the vessel's more important. This thing lasts for, for months, if not years to come, if you treat it well. And you can reuse it over and over again. And, and today, I want to talk to you about this simple thing. When it comes to leftovers, we can see some simple, because we're lazy, value in, but, but leftovers, they have less nutrients, they have less value. But for many of us, when it comes to our faith, we're living on leftovers also. We haven't done anything different. We, we continue to live on what we once had long ago. Like I I used to pray, I used to read my Bible, I used to do things, and you're still like living on that to kind of hold you and continue you. For some of us, we're living on the leftovers of our parents' faith. You know, as we start this conversation in this new year, uh, it comes actually uh, with this survey that we did six months ago where we asked many of you, uh, how are you doing? Like, how's just life? How's your health? But how are you doing also in your faith, like your, your spiritual walk? How are these things? And if there were some things that you could do or have, what would you want? And, and one of you put it this way. You said, man, uh, uh, how do I seek God on my own? And the statement was with this. It was, how do I seek God on my own, like without my parents? Like, how do I apply God's word and, and grow in God's word? How do I do this? And every year in January, our goal is this, that we start the conversation with how do we just apply God's word? How do we grow in our, our prayer life? How do we grow in these areas? Because if we start the year off with this as our foundation, it leads us for a better year. So as we start this conversation in this series for the next three weeks, it's called 21 Days of Prayer and Fasting. We're going to have a conversation where we're going to look at different things from our, uh, the Bible to prayer. We're going to talk about fasting. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. Uh, oh, for the next 21 days, what if we could grow our prayer life? And, and something you can do right now is go on our website and you can download a prayer journal that our team created where it'll help guide you through the next 21 days. So if you're like, okay, I want to pray more, but I don't know how to, maybe start here with that journal just to help kind of give you that vessel. But what if for the next 21 days, we start to open God's word and actually let it change us? Over the next 20 days, we're going to have events that we've called master class, and you can register right now, but we're going to talk about uh, the Bible. Can we trust it? We're going to talk about fasting. What is it? We're going to talk about the spiritual gifts. Do they still exist? We're going to have conversations to help us, prepare us to build a foundation for 2021, the year to come. I want to have this conversation, but it always starts here. Every year, we always start with this. And the title of my sermon is this. I need the word of God because I need a better way. I need the word of God because I need a better way. That we would start here. We need God's word in our life. This is what transforms us. This is what equips us. This is how we understand reality and truth in our lives and guidance. So we're going to start in the Word of God. We're going to look at 1 Thessalonians 
chapter 5, verse 12. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12, it says this. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. They work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance. Show them great respect and wholehearted love because of their work and live peacefully with each other. Brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are lazy, encourage those who are timid, take tender care of those who are weak, be patient with everyone, see that no one pays back evil for evil, but always try to do good to each other and to all people. Always be joyful, never stop praying, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Do not stifle the Holy Spirit, do not scoff at prophecies, but test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good, stay away from every kind of evil. Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until the Lord Jesus Christ comes again. God will make this happen, for he who calls you is faithful. Now this section of scripture, for the next three weeks, this is where we're going to stay. And we're going to look at different sections in it. And, and, and what I want you to know is throughout the whole letter, 1 Thessalonians, Paul is writing to a group of people, to a church, that, that is outside of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the Jewish faith. They didn't grow up with it. They grew up with other ideas and other philosophies and all this stuff. So he's writing to them and he's recognizing some things and he, he knows that they grew up different. He knows that their society was different from others. And this parallels with us in so many ways. For them, they grew up and they had so many different philosophies and ideas and they came with their different arguments. And for us, all the time we're inundated with like blogs and shows and podcasts of people who believe different things. And it's like, where, where do we stand? And Paul is entering this moment. He's writing to this church and throughout this letter, he's setting them up, giving them like a workshop, if you will. He's like, Here, here's what you need to know. Here, here's, here's the value, the basics, what matters most. And he starts here with them. And for us, this is a similar goal. And he, he writes this to encourage and strengthen the church. He says that in chapter 4, verse 1. He's to teach holiness and church behavior and, and secular ethics. He's, he's speaking of all these things, but he has a shift in the conversation. He transitions from actions outside, and then he starts to focus on the inside. He starts to focus even on between you and God. What does that look like? How does that apply? What is that? How do you, how do you live that out? He starts to talk about how do you live that out as a church community, as brothers and sisters in Christ? How do we encourage and, and, and sharpen each other and lift each other up? And this is where we enter. And I want us to first look at verse 16. It's three simple words. It's three simple words. It's always be joyful. Always be joyful. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear that, I'm like, okay, but always means like, like, like always, and I don't know how you're always going to be joyful because life happens. For many of us, we, we know life happens. Like, what if you lost your job? You lost that marriage. You lost that relationship. You lost a loved one. What if you, you've experienced hurt and hate and, and, and gossip and, and all this stuff in your life? We've experienced pains. How can you always be joyful when that stuff happens? This isn't Disney+. Plus. It's not about a fairy tale of a princess that walks out in a forest and there's little birds that come and she's like, la, 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 and all the animals come and they start singing together and they do her hair and they found ribbons somehow in the forest and life is perfect and you can always be joyful. No, we've experienced pain. How can you always be joyful when pain comes? And Paul, what he points to and he speaks of rejoicing, but how he's speaking of it is it's this personal, it's this present, and it's a permanent duty. So if, if that's the case, then, then how, how, what is joy? Like, how can you always be joyful? And he says it, he says, in all circumstances. Paul has a deep-rooted understanding of God's Word. And I think this is the most important thing that you need to hear. The reason he can say, always be joyful, because if you know Paul's life, you know that he went through so many pains. The reason he can say, always be joyful, 
is because he has a deep understanding of God's word. He knows the whole Old Testament. He grew up on it. He's seen God and the Holy Spirit working in his life as he writes this letter. So he can say this with a deep conviction because he, he knows something more. And for some of us, I, I, I think where it really matters is that we understand that it starts at God's word. If we understand God's word, then we can start to understand why you can always be joyful. See, it, it, it's not that everything is always good. It, it, it's that we know that God works all things for our good. So when we understand it in a different perspective with a, a, a fresh understanding, with the proper understanding, we can start to see maybe how can you always be joyful because you're seeing things not as a, a moment in time. Like for so many of us, our joy is reliant on others. So if someone says, I look good today, I'm like, yeah, I'm happy today. Like all of a sudden, if they say like, nah, you don't look that good. Like all of a sudden it's like, well, man, I hate you and I hate my life. Like what is happening? That's not where joy is found. Like for some of us, you've been waiting in the queue for PS5 and you keep on getting too far and it's not available. And you're like, man, I'm never going to be happy. That's not where joy is found. So we have to understand what is joy and where is it discovered? And God's word lays this out for us. See, Paul didn't say, give thanks for all circumstances. He said, give thanks in all circumstances. There's a big difference. Remember, Paul's been persecuted and beaten and kicked out of cities. He's not thankful for all those circumstances. He's experienced hurt and difficulty. He's thankful in all circumstances, no matter what circumstance came. He's thankful in it because he knows a bigger picture. He, he knows what's most valuable. And this is where, I'll say it this way, and, and I know people use it in different arguments, but I'm using it for, for, for this argument, for God's word, and, and it's, it's facts over feelings, right? For some of us, we care so much about our feelings that we're, we're not recognizing the facts. And I think when it comes to always be joyful, it's because we're not going to the facts of the word of God. We're going to our feelings, our emotions. Your emotions fluctuate. They change. You go through moments and you're high and then you're low. You, you can't rely on, on your joy being found in your emotion because your emotion goes like this. Find it in facts, what God has said, what he is doing. You know, uh, I, I truly believe this. It doesn't mean life is always perfect and easy, but I do believe when we start to know God's word, we start to trust God's word, and we start to live it out, life is better. And, and I can give you facts. Last year, I shared some of them, these stats. If you were to read your Bible daily, and by daily, I mean four times a week. For some of you, hopefully you recognize that's not even daily. If you read your Bible Monday through Thursday, if you were to read it that many times, stats, your addiction and issue with pornography lowers by 61%. Facts, if you read your Bible four times a week, your marriage issues, the, the division and the difficulty and the arguments and all this stuff, it lowers by 68% on average. Facts, if you read your Bible Monday through Thursday, your addiction to substances decreases by 57%. Facts, if you read your Bible Monday through Thursday, your action of sharing your faith, the good news of who Jesus Christ is with others, increases by 228%. There's stats to this. They've done pools of people that have committed to this and, and they've discovered these numbers. So what I want you to hear right now is when you read God's word, it, it, it doesn't always mean everything is perfect and easy, but I will tell you everything is always better. So when you want to overcome issues, start to start where everything begins in God's word, what he has given us. See, I want you to hear this. I need the word of God because I need a better way. This is the better way that we start at the word of God for each of us, that this is where we commit as we start this new year out. But verse 16, it's, it's three words, and then it continues. And verse 17 actually follows suit in the same way with three words. And it just says this, never stop praying. And again, I go, okay, hold up. 
like never stop means like to constantly continue doing this. And, and ain't nobody got time for that. Like I can't sit at the bedside and pray all day. Like y'all got to go to work and do something. So what does this mean? And really, I believe Paul, he, he shows it in different instances, but I believe in this moment, he's showing prayer as a lifestyle. Because for some of us, we might look at prayer as like, I got to pray. And I'm going to say like, thank you, Jesus, for this day and my family and all this cool. Okay, cool. Good. And then you go and you don't give God any recognition throughout the rest of your day. You don't live that out in communi community and communication with God. I think Paul is showing us like, hey, just never stop. Continue to involve God in everything. Now, I don't think that means that's the only way we pray. I do believe there are times where we need to stop, where you need to just be you and God, where you need to let everything else out and just commit to time with God. But I believe he's showing us it's, it's not this either or lifestyle. He says, never stop praying. And my, my question to you and my concern for many of you is you've stopped praying long ago. You, you might be praying right before you eat dinner, but can I be honest? And maybe this is divisive. A lot of times I don't even call that a prayer anymore because y'all just like me, too often I, I, I'm so hungry that I'm like, thank you, God, for this day, for this food, for the hands that prepared it, and amen. Okay, cool. Like, no, nah, I'm not talking about that type of prayer. I'm talking about a, a community, a, a communication with God. For too many of us, we stopped praying long ago because either you haven't seen results or you've been hurt too much. For some of us, our, our faith, it can't, it can't die because the answer comes slowly. See, the delay may be God's working. For some of us, we, we just need to recognize that, that the delays in our life may be where God is molding and equipping us. Can I tell you, 2020 like was a year where our church, we had plans and momentum with certain actions that were going to take place, where we were going to reach new communities and we were going to do certain things. And, and then 2020 came and, and that wasn't what was planned for. So everything was delayed and stopped and shifted. And, and all of a sudden we can go, well, I guess God's not in it. No, what I actually saw is God used it for something else where he equipped the believers in a different way. I'm more confident in my faith than I've ever been. I'm more convicted in my standing than I've ever been. I've grown in certain areas that I didn't plan on growing or I wasn't working on, but God used it for my good. And I can tell you today, I know many of you can look at your life and go, man, God has delayed me in certain areas that I can look back on now and say, what a blessing because he was working through that, what I saw as a stop. It's moments where we see the importance of patience, but also we need to see the importance of persistence. See, Jesus shares this story of a, he calls her a, a persistent widow. It's found in Luke chapter uh, 18, verse 1 through 8. And he just shares this story with his disciples. And he's like, hey, there's this widow. And she goes to the king requesting certain things. And the king continues to send her away. But she's persistent. So she continues to go back to him. And he finally gives in is how he shares it. But then he's like, hey, this is like the kingdom of God. And you, be persistent. Continue to go to your king, to God. Continue to go to him and he will provide for you, but it might not be in your tummy, but continue to be persistent. For some of us, we need to have a prayer life that is persistent. We need to enter 2021 persistent in our prayer. My question for some of you is this, do you believe God works all things for those he loves? Scripture says it, Romans 8, 28 says it, that God works all things together for those he loves, for those he's called. So if he works all things, and if, if you can accept that statement, if God works everything, all things, no matter what it is, he's working it still. He'll use it for our betterment. Then the question comes like, well, what about that job that you lost? What about that, 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 that business that you started that you went into debt over and now it's nothing? What about the marriage that you're facing that's on the brink of disaster? What about those issues in your life? Can you look back and say, is he working those for your good also? Scripture says it. Can you, can you trust that? And this comes to this point where we look at a prayer life, and, and, and for some of us, 
my concern is that you're not persistent in your prayer life. And by that, what I mean is you've stopped long ago believing God for anything. You've stopped long ago going to God, persistent, just calling on Him. Maybe even, we see it with other stories in Scripture, maybe even you wrestling some with God, like, man, I don't understand. Why is my life looking this way? Why am I facing this stuff? Going to God, persistent in prayer. You're not believing God for anything. Maybe you need to start actually believing Him at His Word. But for some of us, you need to start being patient. Because you pray and then you're expecting everything to show up the way you expected the next day. Sometimes there's delay because God is working something greater than what you imagine. I know for me too often I, I get so comfortable that I stop being persistent in my prayer life. I stop expecting things from God. Start Stop believing God at his word. It's the area where we say, hey, where can we grow in our faith? It's when we go to God and we go to his word and we go to communication. I need the word of God because I need a better way. You know, a year ago I shared a a, a prayer uh, kind of like guide that I, I've applied to my life that has helped me. Because for many of us, we can, we can say, okay, I want to pray more, and, but then you're not sure, how do I do that? Like, what does that look like? How do I apply that? Like, do I just, hey, God, thanks. Like, cool, okay, hey, I don't like this situation. Like, no, what, what does that look like? And, and I gave you this last year. For many of you, maybe you've seen this, and if you would like, take notes right now because I'm not showing it on a screen. you got to do your own homework if you want to apply it, and it's called ACTIVE. And it's an acronym. It stands for something. So active, A, for adoration. So I start my prayer out this way. Every time I I pray, I try to apply active prayer in my life. And it's A, for adoration. That I just am in awe of God. That you could look around, look at the world. Like, how amazing is God? that he would create a universe and a world, an earth, that would stand in a certain place in our universe that that wouldn't be too far because we would die, wouldn't be too close to the sun because we would die, but somehow we can exist here. How amazing. How amazing. Look at the human anatomy. How amazing is God that that he would create this and I could live and survive. This body would even repair itself. How amazing being in awe of God. A for adoration, and then C for confession, that that I would go to God and just recognize of my own accord, of my own ability, I am not good enough. But because of God's amazing grace, we'll get to that. But confession, even now, uh, God's word I can apply to my life and I can see too often where I allow my own selfishness to take over instead of applying God's word. That I I would go to God and just repent and recognize. A for adoration, C for confession, T for thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, just thank God. Just give God thanks for all he's done, for all his blessings, for that amazing grace, for the things that he's done in your life. Look at your family right now and just be in awe of the amazement and thankfulness of God. Look at all that you have, how blessed we are. A for adoration, C for confession, T for thanksgiving, I for intercession, Intercession. You might not know what that word means. You don't really use it that often. What it means is that we would pray to God for others, that we would intercede, that maybe there's someone that we need to be praying for. Maybe there's someone that, that, that maybe it's that adult child you have in your life that has, has walked away and disconnected and, and moved away from their faith. And, and right now you would intercede and just go, God, I just pray, would you do something amazing and transform their life and call them back home and all this stuff. Maybe it's, it's another area. Maybe it's for someone's health that you would just go to God in prayer for someone else. A for adoration. C for confession. T for thanksgiving. I for intercession. V, for vanquishing Satan. Now, that's a weird one. It had to work for a letter, an acronym, but what it means is this. For too many of us, we don't recognize there's spiritual warfare. There are things happening around us. Can I tell you right now, I believe this, and this is the perfect time for you to hear it. 2021 has entered. 
And for many of us, we're like, okay, I need to get my life right. I need to figure things out. And I do believe it starts with God's word and in prayer. And if you start there, can I tell you right now, over the next 21 days, you're going to experience some pressure pushing against you in different ways. Why? Because you're actually following and applying God's word in your life. And Satan and spiritual warfare will come. But this is where we go, God, I know you reign supreme. Will you protect me? Will you work your thing? Will you do your thing? But we recognize it. For too many of us, we don't recognize there's spiritual warfare going on. A for adoration. C for confession. T for thanksgiving. I for intercession. V for vanquishing Satan. And E for extreme prayer. And this is one that I began to apply to my own life more recently. And it was years ago now, but for all of us, that we'd have some extreme prayer. We would expect something greater that God would do in our lives, in others' lives, that we couldn't even imagine or see a way about it. For me, years ago, I I remember an extreme prayer I had. I lived in Florida, and I was praying about this church, going, man, there's something about this church and coming back to this place that God would do something amazing, that he would reach communities and that I could be a part of it. And can I tell you, hey, if you look back, you can see the extreme prayers God provides. Now, it might always be a little different sometimes than what you expected, but it's, it's starting to believe God for something. For some of you, maybe it's like, man, we got mounds of debt. I don't even know how we're going to survive this. Just pay the monthly and we're not sure. But maybe you start to go, God, I know you can do something. Would you give me vision and direction so that I could be more financially stable? Maybe it's, it's God, my marriage is a disaster right now. We sleep in different rooms. We don't ever talk to each other. Would you do something? Would you humble us? Would you show us, direct us, that you would reconcile us and you would believe God for something that you can't fully see? How does it come about? That's an extreme prayer. So here's my challenge. For the next 21 days, would you begin to pray? And maybe would you apply this to your life where you adore God for who he is? And would you, would you confess, would you recognize there are things about me that, that sometimes I'm holding on when I need to surrender? Would you just thank God for the blessings he's already provided? Would you start to intercede and pray for others, pray for your church? Would you start to recognize there is spiritual warfare around, that you would stand strong, that he would give you the strength? And finally, would you start to have an extreme prayer, believe God for something that you could never even imagine accomplished of your own ability? So here's the thing. Here's the commitment that I ask of you. This series, 21 Days of Prayer and Fasting, would you join me? And for the next 21 days, would you join me in reading every day? Not just four times a week, but every day for the next 21 days. You're not sure where to start. Read a chapter a day. Read a chapter a day because I believe sometimes we can just read a verse and be like, that's a nice verse, but we don't know the full context. Read a chapter and let it start to speak to you. And just over the next 21 days, see what God does with you just reading a chapter a day. Would you pray for the next 21 days every day? And if you're not sure how to, do active, but also we have a prayer journal that you can download right now on our website. Let that guide you so you would grow in your prayer life. Over the next 21 days, I'm not asking you to fast every day for the next 21 days, but what I am saying is in the next weeks, we're going to have conversation about what is fasting? Is there value to it? Why is it important? We're going to have conversations about that. We're going to have conversations And we're going to start to see, and I've shared this, and you've already applied many of these things on your own. Like for me, I fasted from the news because I want to have joy in my life. How am I always going to be joyful when I got news around? No, I don't need that garbage always. I need to find something else. For some, I've heard of people that said, hey, I I stepped away from TikTok because it started to be the place I would go before I go anywhere else. And I wanted to go to God before I went to TikTok. Fast from something. It's not just food. But we'll have that conversation in the weeks to come. So here's my thing. Right now, if you're ready to commit to make 2021 a year where God does something new in your life, will you commit for the next 21 days? If you will, hey, maybe make social media the place where you make that commitment so others even see it. But for us, would you tag the church and we could come alongside and support and encourage you throughout the next 21 days? We're going to read our Bible. We're going to go to God in prayer. We're going to see him prepare a new foundation for us for the year to come. See, I need the word of God because I need a better way.
this is the better way when we go to God's word. But before we we finish, I want to just come back to verse 18 now. So I said, always be joyful, never stop praying. And now it says, it says, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. What Paul is saying right here, what's important for us to hear is, is we can be thankful in all circumstances because we know the bigger picture. Why? Because we belong in Christ. This is the victory, the, the battle that's already been won. This is the picture. So, so how do we have joy and how do we have thanksgiving in our heart in all circumstances? It's because we see the bigger picture. It's because we see what God has done for us. So even when things are hard, because it's easy to celebrate and be thankful when things are good. When you have more money than you know what to do with, hey, yeah, thanks God. No, how do you do it when things are difficult? Because we're not looking at just a circumstance as our emotional dictation. We're, we're looking at the word of God and what he has done for us in our lives. I need the word of God because I need a better way. For some of you today, I want to talk to you. that this is, this is where I can always be joyful. Never stop praying. Always be thankful. Is because I recognize a statement we say here as well. Belong in Christ. I recognize my identity is in Christ, that Christ has transformed my life, that he has brought me from the ruin and he's made me new. And for some of you, I believe today is the day, the beginning of 2021, where that transformation occurs in your life as well. I believe this is the moment where you surrender, you recognize Christ as your Lord and Savior. And I don't believe there's a special word or a special action that you have to do. But I do believe it's a, it's a, it's a, a word that we say in the sense of it, it goes to our mind and our heart that we understand what Christ has done. It says believe. What does that mean? How do I, how do I believe? And, and for us, often I, I guide you through a prayer because I believe that's where your words enter your mind and enter your heart. So right now I want to ask you, but I ask our entire church, no matter where you are, no matter how long you followed Christ, we all say this prayer together right now. Would you pray this prayer with me? Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, I recognize you as my Lord and Savior. God, I repent. I recognize on my own I am not able. But God, because of your amazing grace, your provision, you have provided for me. God, I surrender my life and I find new life in Christ. It is because of that amazing name, that holy name, that we can say, Amen. If you said that prayer with me right now, I want to celebrate with you. So if you will, would you text accepted Jesus to the number on the screen that we would celebrate together? Because here's the thing. This is the beginning of a journey, not the end. This is where we recognize Christ. And now how do we then live that out? How do we live in the fullness of all things that he's doing in our life together for our good? And it starts here in the new year. 2021 is going to be an amazing year. Why? Because for the next 21 days, we're committing to God's word. We're committing to hear God's word through prayer. We're going to God first. I want you to hear this. I need the word of God because I need a better way.